Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you could be here tonight for such an exciting event. I'm Lindsay Jones, the President and CEO of the National Center for Learning Disabilities. Tonight, we are proud to partner with Eye to Eye National to bring you Here I Stand, perspectives on being an advocate in a changing world. This is a hybrid event, part storytelling workshop and part call to action. The speakers you'll hear from tonight will tell their stories of advocacy, what drives them, how they became advocates, and what they're doing now to make their voices heard in a fast-changing world. We hope you'll listen to these diverse stories and identify things that resonate with you and your own drive to be an advocate. The last section of the event will feature a call to action for our, all, everyone joining us on Zoom tonight. You will be challenged to take your story and connect it to our call to action, which is focused on investing in education for students with disabilities. This isn't the only action you can take, but it's an immediate one that can have a big impact. Before we start, I wanna thank our fabulous speakers and all of their organizations who partnered with us tonight. Thank you, Young Invincibles, Student Voice, Autistic Self Advocacy Network, and Make the Road. And special thank you to Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. We're so honored to have you here. Finally, I just wanna remind everyone, you can enable closed captioning by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your window and selecting the enable auto transcription. You will have full access to the chat and the Q&A sections of the event. Our teams at NCLD and eye to eye will be monitoring and answering questions as they come up. Uh, but we also have a, an open question and answer section at the end of all of our speakers. Okay, let's get to it. Thank you all again. And please join me in welcoming Megan Whitaker, NCLD's Director of Policy and Advocacy. Megan, kick us off. Thanks, Lindsay, and thanks to everyone for being here with us tonight. I wanna to welcome our first guest of the evening, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Congresswoman Presley represents Massachusetts' seventh congressional district and is serving her second term in Congress. Despite having had many official titles, Congressman Presley has held on to one important title her whole life, and that is activist. In her career, she's broken many barriers and paved the way for others. She was the first woman of color to be elected to the Boston City Council, and she's the first African-American woman elected to represent Massachusetts in Congress. In her time in Congress, she's been an activist on some of the most important issues facing our most vulnerable communities. She's put forward strong proposals to end discriminatory discipline and has been a champion for children and for improving our public schools. Congressman Presley, we are so honored to have you here with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Megan. It is uh, my honor. Appreciate that warm welcome. And uh, I'm really excited to be in virtual community with you tonight and to have this conversation. Uh, for those of you uh, who are meeting me for the first time, uh, the most important thing to know about me is that I am my mother's daughter. May she rest in peace and power. I grew up in an activist and organizing household. Uh, my mother uh, held many jobs to make the ends meet. And there are many important lessons that she poured into me, but uh, one that I revisit the most is that in life, there's a difference between your job and your work. Your job is what pays the bills and your work with a capital W is the work of the upliftment of community. I grew up on her hip at tenants' rights meetings and, and advocacy and political engagement was such a daily part of our lives uh, for as far back as I can remember. I think I've been an activist uh, since I was in utero. So I appreciate your offering that, Megan, as the uh, a defining characteristic uh, for me. It's a huge part of my, of my identity. And that is because you know when you're born into the struggle, of liberation and justice. The work of community building and advocating for a world that sees our humanity fully. It, it does become a part of your daily uh, experience. I remember uh, spending time with an advocate uh, with the disability community and I asked her, you know, how long have you been an advocate? And she gave me her, her age. Um, and it took me a second to catch up. That's right. She's been an advocate um, since the very beginning of her life because she had to be. So without a doubt, uh, that which my mother poured into me, that there's a difference in life between your job and your work and the work with the capital W is about the upliftment of community. Uh, that is something that I carry with me every single day. 
uh, every day in the halls of Congress. I fundamentally believe that the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power, driving and informing the policymaking. I believe in the power of our stories, of our struggles. I believe deeply in the power of the people. Another lesson my mother taught me early on as someone who was a movement builder and an activist and an organizer uh, to never underestimate the power of the people. So I'm, I'm so encouraged that so many of you are advocating in your own right, sharing your lived experiences to craft public policy that is more just and that is more responsive. And whenever I'm in the company of advocates and table shakers like you, I think of those who've come before us and fought for our, what I would consider our shared humanity and our collective liberation. I know that uh, very often in the sort of sanitizing or revisionist history, or writing of history rather, um, you might be tempted to believe that the civil rights movement, these sort of black and white grainy images of long ago, and you know, Rosa sat and Martin marched and John crossed a bridge, and then overnight, our full liberation was realized. But we all know that isn't true. We're still in the civil rights movement, and disability justice is a key central aspect of that fight. Our destinies are tied. The disability community in America has faced systemic disenfranchisement in the form of what I would characterize as policy violence for generations from unconscionable barriers to healthcare, to income limits for those seeking accessible housing, to education policy that leaves far too many behind. We find ourselves in a moment of national reckoning on racial injustice. And I fundamentally believe that disability justice must be a part of that intersectional conversation, of that intersectional movement, of our intersectional legislating. We must affirm that Black disabled lives matter. When nearly half of those murdered by police have a disability, we know that our systems are deeply broken. And together, we must legislate healing, justice, and accountability in the same way that through policy violence, there was a precision in exacting hurt and harm. So if we can legislate, discrimination, if we can legislate hurt and harm, then we can legislate with the same precision, equity, healing, and justice. But that all begins with honest conversation about where we stand and intentional legislation must follow. Now, disability justice is not just about one bucket of policy. It is a critical lens that we have to bring to every decision and every policymaking table from my ending push out act to the historic organizing that led to a commitment from President Biden on home and community based services funding. And the National Center for Learning Disability is an eye to eye. You have been thoughtful and intentional partners in this work. Day to day and week to week, what it means to be an advocate and an activist can look different to each of us. What is important ultimately is that we stay true to ourselves that we honor our authentic experience and that we lead with our hearts. So know that you are stepping into a tradition of truth telling and organizing with deep roots. We are still in the civil rights movement. That means you are all freedom writers. You are all justice seekers. Thank you for honoring that tradition and know that you are not alone. I'm right alongside there with you. I believe in the strength of this movement. And together, I know that we are truly getting closer to building a more just nation. And now I'm happy to turn it over to any questions that you might have. Congresswoman Presley, thank you so much. Uh, you are such a moving and powerful speaker. I tried not to get on camera soon enough because you uh, <laughs> brought me uh, to a place um, I we did collect a few questions in advance tonight from some of our young adult advocates. Um, the first one um, that we have for you is, what advice would you give to those 
folks who want to be advocates and use their voices, but aren't sure where to start? Right, you know, the challenges are so great. And so um, it can be overwhelming. And so I would say, you know, start with where you are, you know, as the saying goes, bloom where you plant, where you're planted, right? So there's no shortage of work to do. You can write to your member of Congress about an issue that matters in your daily life. You can learn about local organizing efforts. There are so many folks at the community level organizing to meet the pressing needs of folk, of your neighbors, of our community through mutual aid. Uh, which is something that I have been so inspired by throughout the pandemic, just uh, community and neighbors standing in the gap um, and providing that mutual aid. That's really how we've pulled each other through. And that's included everything from homework networks uh, to peaceful protests. And then of course, obviously I'm biased, but engage with groups like NCLD and Eye to Eye. Also, it can be helpful to team up in your efforts. Um, I'm an only child. But I, I say that the reason why I took to the work of organizing and electoral politics and movement building, other than my mother's very righteous example, is that I love the community and the family, what I would call chosen family, that you find along the way. Um, this is really a way with which to build community too. So work with a friend, work with a sibling who shares your experiences. And one of the things I love most about organizing and advocacy work, it, again, is the community and the solidarity. So. Um, those are the things that I would lift up. So you can write your, your congressperson. If that's me, hit me up. <laughs> Again, learn about local organizing efforts and um, lean in on those mutual aid efforts. And, um, you know, there's a role for everyone in the movement. So just know that some people are going to be on the front lines and some people are going to pack the lunches for the people that are on the front lines. Some people are going to hold the signs and some people are going to create those signs. You know, so there's honestly, there's a role for everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, the next question we have is, um, what do you think Congress will do to expand and protect the rights of students with disabilities? And how can those of us in this movement support congressional action? Well, I can tell you what I'm going to continue to fight for and organize for uh, and to demand is that we do not recover back to a pre-COVID status quo normal. Uh, if we want to truly build back better, then we're going to have to be very bold and very intentional when it comes to our policies and to our budgets. And we should always design and craft these policies in partnership and centering the most marginalized. And that includes our students with disabilities. Um, I was deeply concerned throughout the pandemic about the civil rights infringements our students with disabilities were being denied, you know, the accommodations and supports that they have a legal right to, you know, very often because we're having to, to organize and, and fight and demand uh, the most basic things or things that have already been um, granted us, um, you know, by the laws of this nation. Uh, th this is not charitable. <laughs> this is what you deserve. This is what you have earned. And very often is, again, what is already on the books, but simply not being honored, not being enforced. There are also some aspects of the innovations we saw in remote and hybrid learning that could serve as helpful accommodations for students with disabilities. And I don't want us to do away with those supports. And the only way we'll be able to codify best practices and policy is, in, is incentivize what works and then address those deep inequities and disparities, again, is by centering the most impacted. And I can't not talk about the IDEA. You know, it has to be fully funded. And then we should be using the funds from the American Rescue Plan to invest in our schools and to prioritize our students of color and our students with disabilities. If it's truly to be an, a rescue plan, then that means we can leave no one behind. You know, certainly the, the pandemic has uh, disproportionately impacted uh, the most marginalized and minoritized uh, communities. But that being said, the, the pandemic and the hardship that it wrought, it did not discriminate. And so we cannot discriminate in our relief. We, we can leave no one behind. So in terms of how you can support, stay in close partnership with congressional offices on this, raise your voice on key issues, flag bills for us, call out gaps and work with us on legislative solutions. My policy staffers are all great partners in this. And, um, and in fact, I know 
uh, my, my uh, chief of staff. And one of the reasons I'm so grateful to have her and one of the reasons why I recruited her uh, is because of her commitment to disability justice. She has a longstanding record. So I do want to shout out a Sarah Girl, my chief of staff, who's been my, my teacher and my partner and my steward in this work. Wonderful, thank you so much. Do you have a time for one more question? I think so. Okay, um, it came into the, the Q&A section. Um, what events or event led up to you wanting to be part of Congress? Oh, wow, okay. Uh, start at the beginning. So, yeah, so look, 25 plus years ago, I was an unpaid intern working three paid jobs in the office of former Congressman Joseph P. Kennedy II. Um, that was when this was the eighth congressional district. Now it's the seventh. And so, the, you know, 25 plus years ago, I was an unpaid intern in an office that I'm now the Congresswoman for. But that internship changed the trajectory of my life. And what it did was demonstrate to me the impact of policy. Um, it, what it did was teach me that the inequities and disparities and racial injustices that we were being confronted with every day through constituent casework, who crossed that office threshold every day, that these things weren't naturally occurring. J Joey, they were, they were created, they were legislated. So I said, okay, we have systemic problems that demand systemic solutions. So I always knew for that reason that I wanted to be a part of a legislative um, body. I say policy is my love language because policy has created hurt and harm. And, and like I said earlier, if it can create hurt and harm, then it can create um, equity, it can create healing, it can create justice. So at the end of the day, it's that I wanted to be responsive to systemic challenges and injustice. And that meant I needed to be a legislator. So there's much more to the story, but we're short on time. So I think that's the, the, the abridged version, the cliff note version. So it, It's a great version. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. And we are so excited that um, you and your staff are so committed to disability justice. Um, I'm sure some of our young adults and parents on the webinar will uh, be talking with you in a couple months when we do our annual LD Day of Action. Well, uh, I hope so. I hope so. And, you know, thank you all for being my partners in this work. And, you know, I should say that the disability community is a big one. And I consider myself to be a member of it too. Um, you know, in that I am navigating the world um, with, with alopecia, you know, as a, as a bald black woman and um, the community embraced me. And um, so I, I consider myself to be a part of the community. So you'll always have my solidarity and, uh, and my partnership. And thank you all so, so much for the opportunity to join you in virtual community. And thank you for what you do every day. Great, thank you so much, Congresswoman. Have a good night. Good night. Great, well, um, thanks everyone for continuing on with us. Um, I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. My name is Joey Hunziker. I am the Director of Young Adult Initiatives here at NCLD. Um, I get the opportunity to work with our fabulous young adults and parents. Um, I am happy to introduce our next speaker. Um, from, uh, uh, from Make the Road New York, we have Adilka Pimentel. Adilka is a Black Latinx organizer who was born in the Dominican Republic, immigrated to the US in 1991 and grew up in Brooklyn. She has been involved in community organizing and advancing public policy in New York State for the last 18 years as a youth leader at Make the Road New York and then a staff um, focused on immigration, education reform, affordable housing and police violence. Adilka organizes with black and brown youth through political education sessions, Know Your Rights sessions, Cop Watch, leadership development, and the arts. Adilka, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, like Joey mentioned, my name is Adilka uh, Pimentel. I use she and they pronouns. I also prefer Adi, so I'll go with Adi. And I'm a lead organizer with Make Their Own New York um, and super excited to be here. And so like Joey mentioned, I was born in the Dominican Republic in 1989. And so um, I immigrated to the States in 1991 and would remain undocumented with my mom for the next uh, 17 years of my life. So navigating um, all the layers that come with being um, 
you know, undocumented in the States with immigrating to the States and leaving behind, you know, a life and your whole family um, and really just navigating through uh, things that I then realized I was directly impacted by including uh, the school to prison pipeline and police violence. And so my first exposure to injustice when I think about it was when I was in elementary school and my mom was a welfare recipient for my younger siblings who were born in this country. Um, and at this point in New York City, welfare offices weren't offering translation services. And so anytime my mom had to go to the welfare office, she would bring me with her and I would be this eight, nine year old kid in a welfare office trying to translate government documents for her and would find myself translating for numerous amounts of um, elderly folk who were there and didn't have any services available for them. And I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what was going on, but I felt wrong. Um, to me, it felt like there should obviously be something in place to help these folks. And so it awakened this very baby organizer in me. And really I started organizing in 2003 I was a freshman in high school um, and I found uh, a safe space. And it's so interesting when we think about what safety means to young people uh, now, what it meant for me back in 2003. Um, you know, I found it in my political home, which was then Make the Road by Walking uh, and currently Make the Road New York. Um, and really just found a space where I can channel trauma and rage that was beginning to surface, right? Because trauma doesn't go away just if you don't think about it. Um, things I learned as, as I grew up, um, you know, I was able to channel it into art, right? I, I realized I love poetry, I love spoken word. I was able to channel it in public speaking, in chanting, in giving testimony at city council hearings, um, in facilitation, facilitating and training new organizers is a passion of mine. And ultimately, everything I do, I do with organizing at the center. I do um, communally, thinking of community. I do you know, moving with a center of joy and, and really trying to find freedom and liberation, not only within myself, but in a system that was built to not allow me to experience that um, as I'm alive. And so, you know, I was in, in high school that had police in it and metal detectors um, and often lived in fear of either being arrested or putting in deportation proceedings. Um, you know, some of the work I do now is work on the larger defund the NYPD campaign. Um, also uh, support a lot of the families, you know, um, who've lost loved ones at the hands of police. So Ms. Gwen Carr, who's the mother of Eric Garner, Ms. Constance Malcolm, who is the mother of Romarley Graham, you know, so many families, Victoria Davis, who is the sister of Delron Small, you know, families who are ignored by our administration, families who are neglected accountability and justice, and families who for decades have really been organizing so that Black children and Black people can step out of their homes and make it back in one piece. And so, you know, when I think about why I organize and what kind of world I want to I wanna try to help build, it's one where Black children are safe. It's one where you know, young people are in school and are getting an education and are deemed worthy of safety and love. It is a world where, you know, we don't have any borders, where prisons don't exist, you know? And it's, it's funny because a lot of people tell me this is a radical vision, and I don't think so. I think it's very common sense. I think we hardly get the time to sit and imagine and dream a new world. And organizing has allowed me to do that with people that I love. Um, I think the Congresswoman mentioned something really important. I have a chosen family that's watched me grow up in the last 18 years doing this work. Um, and I am the organizer I am because of them and their love and their guidance. Uh, lastly, the, the only thing I'll say too is I'm, I also do leadership development um, within my organization and the young people that are amazing and, and, and just phenomenal. And I think a lot of Ella Baker who believe that leaders are developed and not necessarily born. And I know some folks may not agree with that, but I have the pleasure of helping young people really step into their power. You know, the young person tells me, Adi, I'm interested in speaking, you know, at this press conference, but I've never done it. I'm, I'm scared. I take the steps necessary to prep this young person and allow them. And I get the privilege of witnessing the beauty of a young person stepping into their power, finding their voice, 
and really being able to tell their stories while advocating for self. Organizers, we're not saviors, we're, we're guiders and facilitators into people being able to save themselves and empower themselves. Um, yeah, and I'm super grateful uh, for being here uh, and being thought of. Um, and to be in space again uh, with Ayana Presley, who's phenomenal, but really just grateful uh, to be in community. I think that anytime I get a chance to connect with new folk who are ultimately trying to make the world a better place, I think I think it's a great time. So thank you. Adi, thank you so much. Um, your story really struck me and I'm so glad you're with us tonight. Um, for folks in the audience, um, uh, we will have Q&A at the end of the rest of the, the speaker, so Adi will stick around. Um, but if you have questions now, feel free to put them in the Q&A section. All right, thanks Adi so much. Our next speakers, um, are, we have two speakers. Um, Zane Landon is a strategic storyteller and public relations imagineer, leading as a purposeful change agent to manifest personal, institutional, and transformational change. He is passionate about mental health access, disability rights, and diversity and inclusion. He has completed several internships in public relations, marketing, journalism, diversity and inclusion, customer relations, and public policy. Finally, Zane is, is dedicated to creating an equitable world with the power of building community through empowering and inspirational stories. Uh, his partner, Samar Hassan, grew up in Chicago and decided that community college was the most equitable path to begin his higher education journey. As a former undocumented immigrant, he was aware of the realities that marginalized communities faced. After gaining the student government president position, he advocated for fellow community college students where they worked in tandem to push administrators towards tuition reform and accept student voices in their decision-making processes. In 2018, Summer earned the Program for Academic Leadership and Service Award Scholarship and recently graduated from Columbia University, New York. Summer is now the storytelling and engagement manager at Young Invincibles. Um, I'd love to welcome Summer and Zane. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Joey, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here amongst all of you trailblazers and change makers. It's such an honor to be in this space with you all. Um, my name is Samer Hassan. I am the Storytelling and Engagement Manager with Young Invincibles, a policy research and advocacy organization devoted to four key issue areas across the country, higher education, healthcare, uh, civic engagement, and workforce development. How did I get here? <laughs> My parents are from Jerusalem. Uh, they needed to flee the Israeli occupation in the 1960s and my family moved to Venezuela. I was born there along with my brothers and sisters and I um, in the 80s and 90s. And we lived there for many, for many years. I only lived there for a couple of years. And then I moved to the United States where we were undocumented. I was undocumented in this country for a good, I wanna say 20 years. And all I ever wanted to do all I ever wanted to do was just go to college, right? Have that, um, achieve that sense of American dream and try to educate myself, try to move up that economic ladder. But all I was ever told was to stay in the shadows, was to stay quiet and was to know your place because I was undocumented and because anything I would do would be a detriment to my family and our security, right? So um, it was actually, with the help of advocates and organizers like all of you who actually helped me get my green card just a couple years ago. So now I have my, my American residency in the United States and for all my intersectionalities as a, as a queer Muslim, Palestinian, Venezuelan, it's like, this, this is a dream come true for me. And, but I was still not able to go to uh, college because I couldn't really like qualify for any of the financial aid or anything like that. So I saved, I saved every penny I could. And I started college when I was 25 years old and it was almost the same types of hurdles. It was like, you need to stay quiet. You shouldn't advocate. You shouldn't fight for, uh, for a just society. Well, I don't take no for an answer. Uh, we created community and we fought and we advocated together. And, and I truly believe in collective organizing and this really is the American dream for me because we won. We won tuition reform in the city colleges of Chicago, a system 
that caters to 85,000 students in the Chicago land area. We want tuition reform and we won shared governance meetings. So our advocate, our advocates uh, testified and we met with, um, with organizers and influencers across the city and we created community. Uh, and we fought and we gave voices to undocumented people across the city and I, I truly believe the country. Uh, from there, I got a Fulbright scholarship to an Ivy League. Here's a formerly undocumented um, human being in this country who was told he could never go to college in the first place, ended up graduating from an Ivy League university, but it doesn't end there. For me, I believe once you go up that ladder, you need to reach back, you need to reach your hand back down and help the others move up in life, right? Because that's organizing, that's collective um, organizing, that's advocacy. So I, um, I graduated. Uh, last year, and I was thankful to to be offered a, a job with Young Invincibles in their Washington D.C. office. So now I'm the storytelling and engagement manager. But what do I do, right? I uplift um, student voices and advocates and organizers across the country. We uplift their voices and we share their lived experiences with influencers, with policy, with elected officials across the country, and just some of the work that we're working on. Um, includes canceling student debt up to $50,000. We're working on prioritizing health equity. In California, we're working to advocate for universal basic income. In Colorado, we're pushing legislators to end DACA licensure hurdles. In Texas, we're advocating for stronger consumer protections for student loan borrowers, including appointing a student loan debt ombudsman. This, this is just some of the, of the work that we're doing across this country, but all of this, none of this would be possible if it wasn't for advocates like you. So we work with advocates and organizers across the country and we uplift all of their voices and the work in order to achieve policy change, just and progressive policy change. I know that was really quick, but just thank you so much for listening to my story. Thank you, Summer, for sharing your story and being an inspiration for me. So my name is Zane Landon. I'm currently first generation undergraduate student at Cal Life Mona, which is in California studying communication with an emphasis in public relations. So for me, growing up with the intersectional perspective of being queer, disabled, and a student of color in the educational landscape, just to be completely honest, it was not easy for me to navigate. Throughout elementary school, I was on a 504 plan to accommodate the challenges and barriers I was facing at school. Um, but you know, I hear a lot of stories about people being their own personal advocate. But for me, I was very fortunate enough that my mom was my superhero. She was the biggest advocate for me of all time. So she really advocated for me to be accommodated in school for my emotions, mental health, and my attention issues. Um, so I even really struggled in school and I always questioned if I was going to be attending higher education. Um, but my mom, like I said, has always been my main inspiration. She instilled in me the importance of education and that so many people do. I mean, that so many people do not have the privilege to attend higher education, that I need to utilize any opportunity that comes my way wherever I go. So I've learned from her to not be scared of the unknown and to take risks because you never know the path that will open up for you and it can be very exciting. My mom also taught me one of the most important lessons to be an advocate is to lead with radical self-love as well as radical love for your communities for yourself, for your leaders, and for others. No matter what space you're in, your voice 100% matters to make, just make sure you always amplify your voice and have the courage to create change in the world. And this sounds like a solution, but it's not easy. This is incredibly difficult for so many people. Being an advocate is taxing and it's just a difficult challenge, but I only ask that you try. Try for yourself and for someone else that may be worse off than you. I first became an advocate when I was in high school. I joined the Best Buddies organization, which was one of the most influential experiences for me. The organization really defined what advocacy means to me as I identify as a disability advocate. I witnessed the harsh reality of discrimination and segregation for students with disabilities in academia. So after I graduated high school, fast forward to higher education, um, I joined the Access and Disability Alliance, which is an affinity group for students, faculty, and staff with disabilities. They really accelerated my passion for the disability community. I had the opportunity to co-chair a university-wide event, train university professionals on disability inclusion, and create my own impact. I am currently spearheading efforts to create 
a disability culture center. That's something I'm incredibly passionate about. I'm also interning with the National Council on Independent Living, learning about different policies that impact people with disabilities. So I've, since joining Access and Disability Alliance, I've learned so much um, and it really empowered me to share my story and my passion for this kind of work. But what truly gave me the opportunity to advocate on a higher level was when I joined Young Invincibles two years ago. I joined as a regional advocate where I was able to voice my concerns for policy agendas and the work being done at Young Invincibles. So when I saw that there was an opening for the National Youth Advisory Board, I was incredibly inspired to apply and I was incredibly excited when I was accepted. So the Access and Disability Alliance really empowered me at the university level. The Young Invincibles is empowering me even further, which is why I'm even here in the first place. So I wanna thank everyone for listening to my story I do want to share that my mom did pass away in January. Um, so as someone who was my biggest advocate, I felt incredibly isolated and uncertain about everything. But this is where radical self-love is important. At the end of the day, I need to appreciate myself and what I bring to this world because personally, I can't advocate for others if I don't appreciate my self-worth as an advocate myself. So my mom will always be my inspiration as an advocate so I can transform someone else's life in the same manner she did for me. And I hope that you all can find peace in yourself and what you bring to the table. Thank you. Zane, thank you so much. And I know your mom's still your biggest advocate out there. So um, thanks for sharing that with us. And Samer, thank you as well for sharing with us. Um, again, Zane and Samer will stick around for the Q&A at the end. If you have questions, uh, feel free to put them into the Q&A section. Um, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Lauren Proby. Uh, Lauren Proby, she, her, is an autistic self-advocate and disability rights activist from the Chicagoland area. She serves on the Illinois State Board of Education Advisory Council for Children with Disabilities and is also co-executive director of the nonprofit Celebrating Differences organization. Lauren enjoys music, poetry, hosting podcasts with the organization Smiles Today, and spending time participating in Student Voices 2021 Learning Lab workshops. Lauren is also a graduate of Youth Activism Project's inaugural fellowship and Peace First's Black Unity Initiative for Leadership Development, uh, acronym is BUILD. Um, she is proud to be a disabled woman of color and is passionate about projecting the voices and experiences of other disabled Black, Indigenous, people of color and students from therapeutic day schools. Lauren? Hello, and thank you, Joy, for the introduction. So yes, my name is Lauren Proby. I am 17, and I'm an autistic self-advocate and disability rights activist from the Chicagoland area. And I also will be attending the illustrious Spelman College in the fall. So let me begin. Um, my activism story really begins with exclusion. Um, throughout my high school career, I was excluded from the school in my community um, because I was sent to therapeutic day schools. And in these schools, I saw firsthand the countless limitations that are placed upon students in these environments. And I began to understand that I was not going to get what I needed from therapeutic day schools. And so after receiving a, a plethora of help that it was not very helpful. I started to question both the mental health and special education systems. And so I researched, um, I read, I wrote, I just engulfed myself into knowledge because to maintain my own sanity, I had to turn inward. And during the time of obtaining this education, I advocated for myself to be evaluated for autism by a psychologist. And as I suspected, I was autistic. Um, and the 16 year old diagnosis didn't come easy for me because some people, including professionals, don't always understand what autism is and can be. Um, because I'm verbal, because I'm communicative, because I'm articulate and expressive, and a lot of other qualities that people unfortunately don't expect an autistic person to be on top of being a black woman, I was labeled as too aware or too much or too sick or not sick enough. Um, and as you all may or may not be able to guess, that made me angry. And people tend to talk about the angry black woman stereotype, but they speak about that label as though that anger is not justified. I spent a lot of my life being treated like an error. So I was mad about that. And during this difficult period in my life, as I stated, I turned inward. Um, that was just how I survived. And I lived inside my head and I read a lot. 
So in 2019, while I was reading a book titled Our Stories, Our Voices, which is edited by Amy Reed, I found a list of advocacy resources in the book's index. Um, and I really just felt compelled to use my own experiences to bring about change. So one of the resources was Youth Activism Project, um, and it provided the program director's email. And I emailed her. I didn't think she would respond at all. But that summer, I ended up joining Youth Activism Project. And Youth Activism Project, or YAP, is a nonprofit organization that really just mentors and encourages and provides resources to young people who are passionate about activism and who are interested in making social change. And they really work to meet you where you're at. And staff at Youth Activism Project were one of the first people in a very long time who believed in me. And to somebody like myself, who's very often forgotten about and excluded from a lot of conversations, having a piece of my story heard and appreciated and uplifted and valued and regarded as important gave me the confidence to initiate and continue the work that I carry out today. So YAP just opened a lot of doors for me. Um, and one of the most notable activities that I do now um, includes representing students with disabilities on my state board's advisory council, where I'm able to give thought and advocate for legislation passing regarding students like me, students from special education and or therapeutic day schools. Um, and I also participate in Student Voices 2021 Learning Lab sessions, which basically focus on various components of education equity. And that's actually where I was connected to this speaking opportunity. Um, but yeah, to keep it brief, I would describe my focus in activism as disability justice, especially equity and investment for disabled Black, Indigenous, and people of color and students from therapeutic day schools. Because as I said, mainly students from therapeutic day schools tend to be um, left out of a lot of conversations that are very relevant to us. Um, so I say all this to say that finding Youth Activism Project's email and that book sparked an understanding that really changed my life. Um, I've always had a strong voice, whether that voice be internal or external, but I didn't think it mattered because nobody instilled in me or very few people instilled in me that it did. Um, because special education for me was so far from encouraging and there tends to be this hierarchy in education um, with students in therapeutic day schools wrongly, but typically falling at or near the bottom. And because of this, I couldn't see myself as capable, not because I'm incapable, but because I wasn't given an opportunity to see myself as capable. <laughs> so I say that to say that activism for me isn't solely about advocating for others. Um, it's also so important to me because it allowed me to see myself as powerful and within that to be able to multiply that realization. So I guess to close this all up, because I could talk for days, but to close this up, I would say to anybody who's looking for opportunities to become an advocate, um, that activism is really a journey, but it's really what you make it and whatever you want it to be. And I think as long as you keep at your core why and how you came to value activism for what it is, and as long as you remember the power that your story holds and will always hold, everything you need is inside of you already. And yeah, I believe in you. I'm rooting for you. That's it. I tried to keep it brief. Um, my name is Lauren and I'm done speaking. Lauren, that was amazing. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, again, Lauren will stick around for the Q&A um, if you have questions. Um, I am happy to introduce our next speaker, Noor Pervez. Noor is a student organizer turned disability and LGBT plus educator, community organizer, public speaker, and internet researcher. He works at Autistic Self-Advocacy Network as the Community Engagement Coordinator. He is an AAPD Paul G. Hearn Emerging Leader Award recipient and is using the funding to begin the process of making an easy read translation of the Holy Quran. He has bylines at Rooted in Rights and the Disability Visibility Project blog and can frequently be found posting about his beagle, Kibby, on Twitter at, at Snoring Doggo. Noor? Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So as I've been reflecting on kind of the theme of self-advocacy and community advocacy over the past month or so, 
Um, what I realized is that my advocacy journey didn't start with kind of climbing through the traditional activism, like rungs of starting with youth leadership organizations and then going to progressively larger and larger events. Um, although that was like a step along the way, but rather when I think about it, this starts with me as a kid. It starts with me as a non-speaking autistic two or three year old who had a lot of feelings about my own identity and a lot of things that I wanted to do and learn and explore, but wasn't really being given the opportunities or the resources to do that. Um, and I think about the, fa the ways that I self-advocated then and the things that would have been considered problem behaviors, things like saying no to things that I didn't want to do, refusing to go where I didn't want to go, reading what I felt like reading and not necessarily what was around me or what was suggested. And I think about that simple act of pushing for what I wanted. And I think about how challenging it was for me to kind of see that power and that desire and that drive be pushed out of me through my time in the public education system. I think about the fact that I had this drive to learn and grow and read all of these things. And so often it was all disregarded in favor of telling me, no, you need to learn how to talk. You need to learn how to sit still and be quiet. So I find that it's kind of this wave where I, where I started my life with really strong tendencies towards self-advocacy and pushing for what I wanted and needed and then losing that and getting it back with the tools and the power that I was able to pick up once I had access to extracurricular activities like speech and debate and academic decathlon and various parts and pieces that allowed me to use literature and speech on my own terms. And as I got that power, I grew that into opportunity. I was very fortunate to have when things, I was very fortunate in that when things fell through for me, for example, not having funding to go to college, um, that I was able to find resources and scholarships that applied to various identity groups and get through that way. Um, and I ended up only being able to physically attend my college on the on entirely the grace of a friend who was willing to drive me there every day, despite the fact that I didn't have a license. So when I think about self-advocacy and community advocacy, I think about both the internal drive that I have always had to push for what I want and what I need. But I also think about the push that has happened externally for community members to stand up for one another, to show up for one another in the ways that we can. And the and yeah, that did ultimately end up pushing me down kind of my advocacy and activism journey in terms of helping with my local LGBT groups on campus, writing a policy proposal uh, to get L greater LGBT resources and ultimately a physical LGBT center on campus, pushing for greater disability inclusion on my campus and ultimately getting a lot more things changed than we ever thought was possible. And we kind of kept doing that. I was very fortunate to be in community with a lot of other disabled LGBT people who were proud of all of the parts of who we were and who pushed collectively to get each other opportunities to help each other when we were out of energy to get resources to go to the food kit to go to the soup kitchens when we're out of food to cook for each other if we're out of energy take care of each other when we're sick and push for us to always get what we need that spirit of community care carried me through all of these rungs of opportunity whether that was scholarships, attending conferences, and ultimately getting the job I currently have, all of that is predicated on people in my community pushing me to keep growing and doing my best and learning from the people around me. 
anything that I know and anything that I've done, I accredit entirely to the people around me being willing to treat me as a work in progress and support my growth. And my role now um, as someone who does community engagement is to try and build inroads and to try and build bridges across communities so that as we're pushing for disability justice and intersectional justice, like that we are putting multiply marginalized people at the center of the table and that we are continuing to learn from each other, grow from each other and continue working together to push for what we as a community want and need. So yeah, my, my story begins and ends with community support and it begins and ends with being willing to put yourself in a community of people who will give you that support. Awesome, thank, thank you so much, Noor. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, I'm happy to introduce our last speaker of the night and then we'll get to um, questions and answers. Um, our last speaker is Dom Kelly. Dom is the Senior Fundraising Manager at Fair Fight Action and is a passionate disability justice advocate. He's also the founder of Fair Fight Action's Disability Council, which is composed of prominent disability advocates and policy experts from across the country. The Disability Council is working to ensure that disabled voters are included and advocated for by Fair Fight Action as they work to advance voting rights for all eligible citizens. Dom is one of a set of triplets with cerebral palsy and has been involved in disability advocacy since he was four years old. Starting when he was a teenager, Dom and his brothers toured around the world with their rock band, touring and collaborating with artists like Indigo Girls, Joan Baez, The Bangles, and more, releasing seven records over 13 years. Dom did not share this with me when I spoke to him originally, so I just wanna point out my joy in learning this right now. Um, he has since retired from music, devoting his life to advocacy, and currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia, with his wife, Katie, their dog, Vivi, and their cat, Pippi Longstocking. Dom? Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much, Joey. Uh, my name is Dom Kelly. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you about my journey. Um, as Joey mentioned, I am one of a set of triplets. My brothers and I were diagnosed with cerebral palsy at a year old. So when Congresswoman Presley talked about the advocate who said that they've been an advocate since they were born, I, I, I feel the same way. I, I um, have had to advocate for myself um, for my entire life. And um, as Zane said, um, I, I also really look to my parents, in particular my, my mom, as my role model in advocacy. Um, my parents had to advocate for my brothers and I from the start and uh, because we couldn't advocate for ourselves. And they really eventually learned how to center our voices. Um, oftentimes with parents of people with disabilities, they often can center themselves and um, not, not utilize their children's voices. And um, I'm grateful to my parents who did the opposite. Um, my parents taught us to share our stories and be open about our experiences. And so my mom in particular was a huge advocate for us um, everyone in our school district knew who she was. Most people were probably afraid of her. And she helped start a program to educate um, kids in our district about disabilities. And uh, when I was just a little kid, was voluntold to um, share my story to much, much older kids than me. And um, my brothers and I did that together. When we were almost six, my triplet brother, Paul, passed away. Um, suddenly and that really encouraged my identical brother and I to continue with um, with sharing our story and educating our peers about about disabilities um, and in middle school we helped bring that that program to the middle school and then started there um, and we, we did that all throughout school at some point we decided to try and be rock stars um, and so we uh, we started to tour and make records and um, that really that really points back to um, you know, my passion for advocacy really came from a lot of that work in music, the people that we were surrounded by, the, the groups that took us under their wing, really centered activism um, 
in their music. And that was inspiring uh, to us as budding musicians. And we really learned from um, some of those groups that Joey mentioned, um, we really learned how to how to use our platform as musicians to, um, to elevate the causes that we care about um, and center other people's voices in that as well. Um, I currently work for an organization called Fair Fight Action, a voting rights organization based in Atlanta, Georgia, founded by Stacey Abrams. And I decided, I didn't decide, I felt very strongly that um, my organization, while it did incredible work that really benefited um, all voters, that we could be doing more to, um, to help disabled voters uh, you know, we can eliminate, help eliminate barriers for disabled voters. So um, I've formed the Disability Council just this year, um, was able to do some, some stuff during the election last year to, um, to advocate for disabled voters. And um, this year we formed the council. So we brought together a group of really incredible disability advocates from across the country. Um, right now we are focusing on how to make our work at Fair Fight Action more accessible, um, how we can talk to disabled voters. Um, right now, voting rights is, is top of mind for most people. And there is a, a large scale assault on the right to vote um, across the country with 361 anti-voting bills in 45 states. And many of those bills impact disabled voters um, uh, pretty profoundly. So we are working really hard to reach disabled voters. We just put out a statement against um, a really horrible bill in Texas that um, will negatively impact people with disabilities. And we are, we are fighting hard to make sure that disabled people's voices are heard in this, in this fight for voting rights. Um, and so lastly, I'll, I'll say that I learned a few things from being an advocate. Um, the first is that I'm a, I'm a white cisgender straight male. And so while I am disabled, I have, I recognize my privilege and have learned that I have to be willing to center um, the voices of multi multiply marginalized people in my space. I think as Nora also mentioned, um, I also have learned that I don't always have to take credit I, 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 it's important for me to, um, if I do the work, I don't have to be the loudest voice and I don't always have to take the credit. Um, and the last thing I, I've learned is that I have to be willing to create the space. For me as a disabled person, um, sometimes those spaces aren't there for me. And like I did at my job, I had to create this, 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 uh, this lane of work. And so um, I have learned to do that. I have learned to find the courage within myself to, to advocate and to, uh, to create the kind of world I wanna see. So thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled that I was able to speak and I'll turn it back to Joey. Awesome, thank you, Dom. Uh, at this point, I'll welcome all of the speakers to come back on if you'd like to be on camera. Uh, we have a couple questions in the Q&A section. Um, if you have other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or raise your hand and uh, uh, you'll be able to speak. Um, our first question goes back to from Atira um, and this is for Zane. And I'm, actually I think many of you might be able to answer this too. How do you handle the balance of advocating for yourself and for others? So for me, how I started was uh, learning to advocate for others. That's why I joined Best Buddies because the organization is trying to bridge the gap between students with disabilities and without in academia. Um, but then I eventually just learned how to advocate for myself because you know I won't, at that point, I didn't really know a lot about disability advocacy. So for me, it was a huge educational component joining these organizations. And I was like, wow, this actually applies to me. Even when like I was invited to speak here, I didn't realize that you know learning disabilities applied to me, but it really did when I reflected on this, this uh, opportunity. So it's really interesting it's, it's interesting how to, uh, how to balance both. For me, it started with advocating for others and then really along the way advocating for myself. Um, yeah. Great, would anyone else like to answer that or? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, it makes me think of boundaries. Boundaries are super, super, super important. Um, I often tell the young people that if I had the opportunity to 
learn and really put boundaries in place when I was um, a teenager, my life would be completely different. Um, so boundaries are important. Um, I would always say advocate for self first. If you're not well, you can't help anyone really. And so um, whether it's an organizing, advocating and anything else, taking care of yourself is important. So you have to be your, your biggest advocate, you know, and that's a skill. It's not something that's easy. It's, it's difficult. I think about you know, navigating even the medical system, you know, as a black woman is 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 terrible. Um, and advocating for myself is important, but it's not always easy. So it's definitely that. Um, and advocating for others, I would just really say, you know, again, boundaries and sustainability, doing things at a pace that allows you to to move and and not feel like burnt out, because that's a crappy feeling. Um, so yeah, I would say boundaries and then being honest with folks, uh, accountability and transparency goes such a long way when you're building community. If you're not able to do something, and this is something I had to learn the hard way, you know, if you're not able to do something um, or can't show up in the best way, being honest about it, it's, it's, it's important, not only for you, but for the community you're building, because then um, someone could step in or someone can help or someone can help you with what you're going through, you know, so I think some of that stuff. Thanks, Abby. Yeah. Our next question is for Lauren. Lauren, where did you hear about the speaking opportunity that you mentioned? Um, there's another part of the question about wanting to meet for coffee, but you're on different parts of the, the country. So I'll maybe a virtual uh, coffee. And that's from one of our Young Adult Leadership Council members, Haley. Um, do you mean the speaking opportunity? No, uh, Haley, do you wanna, do you wanna um, share what you mean? Uh, yeah, I, um, you were talking about this particular opportunity. You said that you were doing some advocacy work with a certain group and I just missed it. My processing is really slow. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So it's called Student Voice and they're doing like spring learning labs, which are basically like biweekly um, kind of like classes pertaining to education equity and Taylor who is um in charge of student voice she connected me to Joey via email so that's how I found about out about this opportunity gotcha thank you you're welcome thanks Lauren our next question um again for Zane um what distinguished the disability cultural center as a cultural center opposed to something else? Um, and what need prompted that action? Thank you, Kayla, for uh, asking this question. Super excited to talk about disability cultural centers. So to clarify, there is no disability cultural center on my college campus. What we have is a disability resource center. And so essentially the difference between the two, some universities blend the two, but the main difference between the two is a DRC or Disability Resource Center is geared towards academic accommodations and access. So students need to be accommodated academically, you know, extra testing, test spaces, uh, accessible technology, stuff like that. For me, what I realized, and I was talking, talking to a lot of other disability advocates on my campus, and a lot of other universities do struggle with this, is where is like the celebratory identity of disability? Like, where are we actually talking about what it means to have a disability on college campuses? a lot of the times that doesn't exist. And I'm trying to create that space because a lot of students with disabilities are, you know, experience isolation, uncertainty, even before the pandemic. And also there just needs to be an intersectional celebratory welcoming component to what disability is. And the way we approach disability shouldn't just be accommodation. It should be about what does it mean to have this identity and how do you navigate the world and how do we, you know, do different things with intersectional groups. That's why for me, it's all about like the stories we tell and how we tell them, which is why I love public relations. And if you don't know what PR is, PR is like, you know, working with organizations and trying to get them into the media, the mainstream media. And so one day I would like to have my own PR firm where I have clients that are disability organizations and getting them into mainstream news. Because I think people recognize that disability uh, justice um, is relevant, but we're not seeing it in our mainstream media or about mental health. And I think when we start seeing those stories, I think we'll actually start seeing a shift and and just how we advocate. So super excited for the future. Great, thanks, Zane. The next question in the chat is for Dom. Uh, Dom, the Texas bill is terrible. Um, how can people who live in other states like North Carolina help out or what can they do to fight um, 
you know, this attack on voting rights? Great question. Um, there's a few things. The first is you can go to stopjimcrow2.com. It's stopjimcrow2.com. On that website, we outline all a lot of the really bad bills in a number of states across the country. Um, so you'll be able to see a little bit more of the highlights and what how what impact they'll have on black and brown people, young people, disabled people. Um, and you'll be able to have some calls to action on, on how you can actually um, get involved to call your representatives. Um, you can phone bank, text bank, if either of those are accessible with, with Fair Fight. Um, another big thing we're working on right now, it's extremely important that we pass the federal uh, legislation. So the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, those will uh, really, really help if, if we can get them push through quickly um, can really help prevent a lot of these things that we're seeing in states across the country. So one of the ways that we're advocating for that is collecting voter stories. And um, we really would love to hear voter stories from everyone. Um, I would really hope to hear from disabled voters. And um, so you can go to myvotingstory.com. I've got all the websites today, uh, myvotingstory.com. And you can, you can sign up there to share your story. Um, and we'll use that to help advocate for this federal federal legislation. Um, I will say that um, all hope is not lost. There is a lot of work being done. There are a lot of incredible organizations that we're in coalition with who are who are fighting on the ground um, to help protect the rights of voters. So there's there's lots to do and lots of ways to get involved. Awesome. Thank you, Dom. And the last question that we have in the Q and A, and feel free to add a few more. We have a couple more minutes. Um, uh, and this is for everyone, so feel free to answer. What helped you or drove you to succeed? And that could be both academic success or any success that you might wanna mention. Um, I'll start. Um, I, I, I also, I, first I wanna acknowledge Zane's loss uh, of your mother and also say that um, my, my mother died uh, almost four years ago and um, she was really, as I mentioned, my, my inspiration and. Um, and near the end of her life, and she had cancer. She she learned um, she learned everything she could about her her cancer, and learned to be an advocate for herself and for others with her rare type of cancer. Um, and uh, educated doctors. And um, while that's not always possible for everybody, um, she really she really taught me to um, to become an expert on on. You know my disability, um, and that if I want to advocate for something, that I I can I can always um, try to learn more about it. And I think in terms of my success, she really has has continues to drive me. My brother, my mother, everyone that has that has come before me and advocated for me um, has uh, has been an inspiration and helps me want to advocate for others. Anyone else want to answer that one? Sure. So in terms of what um, kind of motivated me to kind of continue with advocacy and also to excel at, to like try and work at school, to be honest, is just there's this sense that frequently comes with being multiply marginalized that you have to have all of the accreditation all of the credibility, you have to build up as many skill sets as you can, because the world will take away power in every way that it knows how, especially as you get older. And I'm not going to say that that's the healthiest reason to go in with that expectation, but I do want to normalize that, like, it's a thing. A lot of us have it. Um, and a measured amount of that drive wasn't a bad thing. It did help push me through school, even though I was frequently being denied accommodations. It pushed me through college because I had access to other people struggling with the same thing. But ultimately, like it alone wasn't enough. The additional piece I needed really was like community support and being able to reach out to people and decompress and continue to kind of engage in both self and community care. Absolutely. Thanks, Noor. We got a new question in the chat. Um, so if anyone wants to answer the last one still, you're welcome to, and I'll, 
I'll answer this one. I'll uh, pose this one to you as well. It's from Alicia. With everything going on in the world, do you sometimes feel for feel forced to choose between your race and your disability? So I definitely have thoughts on this one, but would anyone else like to go first? <laughs> I can go first, but I definitely have thoughts about it too. So yes, I do feel forced to choose um, either my race or my disability. Like people have a very difficult time believing that you can be multiple things at one time. And I think that's so unhealthy. Um, but just in the whole process of like trying to obtain my diagnosis or just in everything, even like in the Black Lives Matter movement or when you think about a lot of protests, like a lot of protests were not even accessible for me to attend. And I wanna advocate for Black lives because I'm Black and even if I wasn't Black, I would want to, but I can't be a part of the movement in the way that I'm expected to because everything isn't always accessible for me because people don't always think about race and disability simultaneously. So yes, and also to the last question, what helped you or drove you to succeed? Um, like COVID like saved me in a lot of ways because as I said, I had a lot of negative experiences with therapeutic day schools and getting away from that environment really helped me to make a lot of progress. So just seeing that I could do things without people saying in my ear, like Lauren, you're dysregulated or Lauren, you need to be in a group home or Lauren, all these things like getting away from that environment really helped me to see that I was capable. And um, even like applying to college, like, getting into college, um, just being able to make progress without um, the way that special education and therapeutic day schools made me feel like I need them really helped me um, to succeed. So yeah. Thanks, Lauren. Noor, did you want also want to answer that? Sure. So I feel like we're kind of covering similar ground here, but like this tendency for advocacy spaces and supports and resources to kind of be siloed by identity group is incredibly harmful because without fail, there will be people who are part of parts of other marginalized groups within that group. And in the absence of an active effort to bring those people into leadership and into power and at the forefront of how you're making things, uh, those resources end up excluding people. And I ran it and I run into this over and over again, both professionally in terms of like resources for young professionals with disabilities very, very frequently <laughs> do not incorporate stuff around racism or stuff around LGBT issues or stuff around people who are trying to learn like professional social norms, for example, who might have grown up with working class parents. Like it's this whole thing where there's one narrative being told at any given point and that can't continue. It's incredibly damaging. And yeah, I do feel compelled to try and choose who I am in any given moment. I have to, because in the absence of that, I am left behind without constantly shoving in front of <laughs> everything that I do. Look, I am in fact part of your community. No, I swear, I am also all of these other things, but I'm a part of it. And there's this need to justify myself that's incredibly unhealthy and that I don't appreciate, frankly. <laughs> And it's really it's it's driven like a lot of really good projects for sure because there are people who are both and of two things and they're making stuff out of that, and that's great. But those projects are largely underfunded. They're out of power, and they require a lot more support than they're getting. Like for example, there was a really fantastic uh, Black Lives Matter march that happened in D.C. a couple. Um, I think this is about a year ago now. Um, that was led by Carrie Gray when she was still with the AAPD. Um, and it was entirely people with disabilities standing together, rolling together and doing an accessible march. <laughs> and we got press coverage several weeks later, but the people who could have platformed that and made it bigger and brought in people who didn't have the benefits and the privilege of being in upper echelons of disability policy, they weren't being brought in. And that's no, and that's not for lack of trying, that's intentional multi-platforming by a society that doesn't recognize the narratives of people who are more than one thing. Thank you, Noor. Um, we have another, a final question in the chat. Um, I will pose this, but if anyone wants to answer the last question, 
or this one, feel free um, as well. So the last question from Lizzie is, what message would you give to people with disabilities who are struggling to find the courage to share their voices with the public or struggling to accept or love themselves? Um, I can answer that. My first thought about the question is, if you don't feel comfortable sharing your story, don't put the pressure on yourself. They don't need to share it right away. I think, you know, there's power to sharing your story, but I also think there's power in, you know, waiting when you're ready. Don't try and find, I need to share my story now. Um, it took me a long time, you know, to come out as LGBTQ, but I needed to find the right time. Um, and that's unfortunate because I, of course, I would like to share it right away. So what, what helped me as a disability advocate was finding an organization that really supported me. And of course, my mom supported me, but it was the organization that really supported me because my mom was going to support me either way with everything I do. <laughs> but with disability, when I joined, they were so welcoming, so supportive. Even if I was, even if I didn't have a disability, or if I was just, you know, an ally, they were so welcoming. Like I loved it. It was so inclusive. So I think finding a space like that, any organization that has volunteer, volunteerism, anything you can do to get involved, to just interact with different people um, is super supportive. And also just kind of reading what different disability advocates have done and, you know, reading like maybe autobiographies on, you know, people who have had disabilities who are huge advocates and what they did, to, you know, um, to share their story and get inspiration from them. So that's, that's what I would say. Thanks, Zane. Any other people want to respond? Um, I don't know what to add to what Zane said because it was a perfect response, but I guess the, the one thing that comes to mind is um, learn about the people who came before you, um, learn about the history, um, watch Crip Camp, um, read Judy Human's book, read the read, read the books, you know, watch watch the watch the movies, um, learn about this community, um, and uh, it, to me, it's been foundational and um, and incredibly in, inspiring. Um, so that's just one addition to what I think was Zane's perfect answer. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I am just so heartened by the conversations tonight and your stories. Um, you know, one of the many reasons that you all are here is because you have these powerful stories that I hope um, the folks listening to tonight can um, take pieces from and, and understand their paths and journeys. Um, may may wander, they may change, they may be inspired by community, they may be um, focused on solving, you know, a discrete problem, but that there's no one way um, to do this work. Um, so with that, um, I'd love to give a round of applause and thank you uh, to everyone, all of our speakers. Um, for those who are listening in, we are, uh, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, we'll be uh, compelling you all to a call to action, but our speakers, you all are welcome to, to sign off if you'd like or to, to stay on. Um, and I'm gonna start screen sharing a couple of slides. And welcome Megan to come back on screen. Thank you, Joey, and thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. It was really inspiring to hear your stories. Um, and we've heard from a number of incredible advocates tonight. Each one of them shared an intimate story about their experiences and their approaches to being an advocate. And through this, you heard what drove them to action, how they've created an impact and a contribution to the causes that they care about. We hope you take away from this evening's event a key message. There is no one way to be an advocate and each path is different and driven by the needs of your community. Everyone who spoke tonight is playing a role in movement building and so can you. You have a story to share and a story only you can tell. It's time for you to use that story in your own advocacy. There are many ways you can advocate whether you decide to push for change in your own community or get involved in large campaigns and national causes. But tonight we're gonna to share one small step you can take to help push for lasting change that can impact every student. And one thing that some of our panelists touched on tonight was their education and how their experience when they were younger in school shaped them. And so improving our public schools is one way, one powerful lever for bringing lasting change for millions of students who may be experiencing things that you have as well. And every year, Congress makes decisions about how much funding will go to our public schools. 
The process to make those decisions has just begun this year and Congress needs to hear from you. We have an opportunity as a community to increase funding for public schools and build a better future for students with disabilities all across the country. As we think about how challenging this last year has been, it's clear that students and teachers are going to need more support than ever. And together we can urge Congress to make a bigger investment in public schools, in students with disabilities, in students in high poverty areas, and in the teachers who serve them. But your story is essential to making that happen. So you can start by going to ncld.co slash invest in us. Once you get there, you can add your story to a message that will be sent right to your member of Congress. Let them know why funding our public schools matters to you. This letter asks Congress to increase funding for a few different programs. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which serves more than 7 million students with disabilities across the country. It asks for an increase to Title I under the Every Student Succeeds Act, which provides funding to schools in high poverty areas, to Title III, which serves English learners, and several other important programs that will ensure teachers have what they need to meet the needs of all learners. So be sure to add your story to your letter and share why this funding is so important to you or how it can make a difference in the lives of students you care about and how it can help us all better support students with disabilities. And if you wanna stay involved and learn more about how to be an advocate and to use your voice for good, you can sign up to receive updates from NCLD at ncld.org slash sign up and we'll send you frequent newsletters and updates about what's going on and ways you can get involved and stay involved.